This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Aloha and welcome to the monthly public lecture of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. It's good to see all of you here tonight. The Vegetarian Society of Hawaii since 1990 has continued to follow our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education as we've grown to become one of the largest nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. We're videotaping tonight's presentation for broadcast on the VSH TV series, Vegetarian. On Oahu, you can watch it on Olelo Channel 52 every Wednesday at 11 a.m. and for this month on Thursdays at 6 p.m. You can also go to our website, vsh.org, to see videos of this and many of our previous presentations. You'll also find lots of other great information there, including recipes, our famous dining guide, past newsletters, and even a link to our own Facebook page. Okay, it's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to have with us tonight our own Dr. William Harris, MD, a vegetarian since 1950 and a vegan since 1964. Dr. Bill Harris is a founder and current officer of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Prior to his retirement, he was an emergency room physician and director of the Kaiser Permanente Vegetarian Lifestyle Clinic. He received his medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco in 1963 and is the author of The Scientific Basis of Vegetarianism, which is now available, by the way, online free at his website on vegsource.com. At age 80, he is an active acrobatic trampolinist and skydiver who has logged over 1,200 lifetime parachute jumps. Just think. <laughs> In this presentation, Dr. Harris cuts through the maze of contradictory dietary recommendations to show how a few simple food rules and a little exercise will ensure your best chances for good health. Dr. Harris's presentation tonight is entitled, Be Your Own Nutritionist. Please welcome Dr. Bill Harris. Raise your hand if you can't hear me. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming. Well, we'll start off by listing some of the resources available at the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. First of all, we have all of our old newsletters archived all the way back to 1990, and we have 125 of the best online vegetarian speakers in the world and you can go there and watch them anytime at your convenience. You can also see them on the public access from time to time. You can go to my website. You can get my entire book for free in PDF format. You download it chapter by chapter. I think there's about 17 chapters. So that's a freebie. Now, this is a big freebie. This is the entire United States Nutritional Database, SR22. 6,200 foods in it and about 191 different nutrient columns. It runs nicely in Microsoft Excel and there's about oh, a dozen sheets with specific things, including a health diary and a place to put your laboratory work. And I strongly recommend that everybody who goes to a doctor, keep their lab work and put it into the database so that you'll know what you had. Just after I finished my training as a physician, having discovered that people would hardly take anybody's advice on what to do to make themselves healthier, I wrote a satirical 
story about a cannibal doctor's parrot. Now, this was about a cannibal doctor who was living maybe oh, 20,000 years ago, and all his patients were cannibals. And he kept telling him, exercise, don't drink, don't smoke, and don't eat people. <laughs> and of course, nobody ever, fo ever followed his advice. So finally, he taught a parrot how to say those same things, and he put the parrot out in the the lobby and the parrot would sit there on his perch and say, exercise, don't drink, don't smoke, don't eat people. So here I am once again. I haven't decided whether I'm the doctor or the parrot, but I've been saying the same quartet of um, phrases for the last 40 years, and I hope somebody, a few people are at least getting the idea. The prime determinants of health are a vegan diet and exercise. Okay, everything else is secondary. All the pills and all the surgeries, for the most part, are way behind these two simple things that you can do yourself. And exercise is not negotiable. You have to do it until you become addicted to exercise and you don't feel right if you don't get your day's exercise. Now, you do not have to become an Olympic champ and you don't have to be a marathoner but some sort of exercise that raises your pulse and your respiration and your blood pressure and breaks a sweat. And you ought to pick three because sooner or later, if you run all the time, something's going to break. And then you can sw move into something easier like swimming or going upstairs or doing calisthenics or riding a bike. And the reason exercise is so important is not because it makes you lose weight. Uh, here's a hundred calories of classic Coke, in order to get rid of that load of completely empty calories, you're gonna to have to go out and run a mile. And I can think of easier ways to not pick up that 100 calories, and the simplest thing is not to drink the Coke in the first place. But anyway, the reason you have to exercise is because nothing heals without circulation. And unless you exercise, your circulation will go south eventually. So the real important reason for exercise is circulation, so you can heal. I also recommend that everybody in this room learn how to fast. That means you don't eat. And that may seem like a really weird idea, but it's built right into your body to be able to go without food for long periods of time, as long as you get enough water. Fasting is a good way to give your body a chance to catch up on its housekeeping, and that's the reason that I think everybody ought to try it for at least a day. You know, if you don't like it, you don't have to do it all the time, but know that it is in you to be able to do it. Well, my 80th birthday caught up with me last December, and I'm the guy in the 80 shirt here, and I also have a blue helmet. First, we all climbed on an airplane and then we all jumped out. I went upside down for a second. and several friends had fun playing footsies with my feet. And when I got down, it was my 1170th skydive. So then I took a friend flying on a Grobe sailplane up on Oahu's North Shore and then for my usual ring and trampoline workout.
You don't celebrate an 80th birthday, you just kind of recognize that it happened and try to move on. <laughs> but anyway, this was, this was the birthday. Okay, the reason a vegan diet works is because all of the essential dietary minerals were synthesized in stars that blew up at least five billion years ago. The plants didn't make the minerals. All of the essential organic nutrients, those are carbon molecules like vitamins and enzymes and such, were synthesized by sunlight in photosynthetic plants, plant leaves. The chloroplasts of the leaves have chlorophyll. The chlorophyll is a gadget for trapping sunlight, trapping solar energy, and the plant leaf then takes inorganic nutrients out of the environment and first makes sugar, and from sugar it then goes to all of the essential amino acids, the two essential fatty acids, all of the true vitamins, plus all of the phytonutrients. And sooner or later we're going to have to recognize that the phytonutrients have as much reason to be called vitamins as the vitamins do, and so we're going to have another couple of thousand vitamins to deal with when people finally realize that. But all of that stuff is made by plants, none of it is made by animals, and all of the essential organic nutrients are made by plants and microorganisms. And there are no exceptions here. So you can make a very good diet out of just the stuff in the background here, providing that you include a little bit of this stuff, which is vitamin B12. It's not that the Photosynthesis goes on just on the hard part of the planet, the part we walk on, it's worldwide. It's present in the oceans as well. Chlorophyll is universal, and these kind of light blue patches have got a lot of chlorophyll in them because that's where the algae hangs out. And algae are little single cell plants that live in the ocean. They are the bottom rung in the marine food chain and the algae make all the protein, fat, carbohydrate, and the vitamins, with the exception of vitamin B12, and they also make all of the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. Plus vitamin D, believe it or not. They synthesize the so-called vitamin D. Now, the fish do not make the D. Cod liver oil is the top contender for so-called vitamin D, but the codfish does not make it. The codfish gets it from algae. So here's the first big rule, and if you don't rem remember anything else from this lecture, remember, if it has no fiber, don't eat it. Number one rule, it's not because fiber is a nutrient. Fiber is not absorbed. Fiber is made mostly out of cellulose, and we lack the enzyme cellulase that is necessary in order to break cellulose down. So it's not that it's a nutrient, but it is a very good marker for healthy food. The foods that still have all their fiber, you can eat as much as you want. And the numbers before these foods, food categories, are the numbers of foods that I put into each one of those categories and then averaged for their content of various things. Now, everything over here, is bad news. Uh, animal food has no fiber. As I already said, animals lack the enzyme cellulase that enables them to utilize fiber, and refined sugar has no fiber, and neither does vegetable oil. Well, the next rule is if man made it, don't eat it. Now this is going to be a hard one because practically everything that you find in the grocery store was made by man, and it'll contain fat, sugar, and salt because that's how the food manufacturers make the food taste better than it is, so you will eat more of it than you should, and they will make more of a profit than they deserve. And here's a typical food label, courtesy of the Food and Drug Administration. First of all, we see soybean oil, that's 100% fat. Salt down here, and see, where's the, oh, there's the sugar, okay. And that'll be in virtually everything you eat. This is an important rule. Fill your stomach and meet your nutrient 
RDAs, that's required dietary allowance, before you meet your calorie needs. Your stomach is going to fill up with food and the stretch receptors in the stomach will tell you that it's time to quit eating and you'll meet your nutrient requirements so you don't need any more food and you do this before your calorie needs are met and so you have to take the calories out of your fat stores and that's how you can lose about a pound a week on a whole food vegan diet. So now I've told you how to be, a, you should be your own nutritionist, but why should you? You should be your own nutritionist because the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, the Internal Revenue Service, and the United States Department of Agriculture, and I might add the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, are distorting the agricultural market in favor of animal food and junk food. That is your tax monies at work. It's actively working against you. If we could just get rid of USDA subsidies, all of the nutritional and medical problems this country faces would simply go away by themselves in a couple of generations because the only reason people continue to eat bad food is because the government is bailing out the, the worst aspects of American agriculture. My first law of nutrition is if servings are mentioned in the recipe, a generous portion of balderdash is about to be served. Servings are different for every uh, food. A, a serving of kale is so many ounces of kale, a serving of milk is so many ounces of milk, but there's no point in putting weight into the equation anyway because there is no RDA for weight in the diet. There is an RDA for calories, there is no RDA for weight, and so we're off on the wrong tack right away. I'm going to steal some thunder from three of our most recent speakers. First of all, Elaine French, who was just introduced. She spoke a few months back, and she talked about a toxic food environment, which is a perfect description of what we've got. And she also said that you should eat low-calorie density food. I'm going to say just the reverse of that, high nutrient density, but high nutrient density and low calorie density are basically the same thing. Janice Stanger said don't worry about protein, fat, and carbohydrate ratios, and I entirely agree with that. And Mike Tian, he dropped 160 pounds by simply getting all of the oil out of his diet. So here's Elaine's toxic food environment down here. There's never been a time in human history when there was so much healthy food to be eaten in which people have eaten so much unhealthy food. And the unhealthy food's down here, it's all got a label on it. The healthy stuff is up here with no labels, but you know you can eat it because it's the food that your distant ancestors grew up on. This is what's wrong with FDA labeling. This is promised margarine. The FDA not only allows this to get by, this stuff is said to be ultra fat free margarine. It's not fat free, it's 100% fat. There's five calories from fat, and there's only five calories in a serving, so five divided by five, that's 100%. That's all fat, but the FDA lets them get away with it. You can see that the fat is in there because the second ingredient after water is mono and diglycerides, and those are fats. So you've got the FDA working against you. And then the next thing that happens is because of all those USDA price supports for bad food, tax deductible advertising distorts the media. You see these things being flashed by you at the time of the news every night. It's going to be very difficult for the reporter that follows this ad to come out and say, hey, this is really unhealthy food. You shouldn't be eating this stuff. The next problem is that the same type of advertising goes to pay for tax deductible grants for peer reviewed studies and those grants distort the biological sciences. The biological sciences are not like the hard physical sciences. If you're researching a paper on x-ray crystallography, the chances are that the people are pretty straight scientists and they will give you the straight scoop on what you're looking for. However, here we have Michael Jacobson, who's the 
head of the Center for Science and the Public Interest, and he has a website here where you can go and track the spore of all the authors who are publishing peer-reviewed articles, and they're taking money from the cattle and meat industry, 31 of them, 43 writers took money from the dairy and milk, 28 from eggs, 13 from fish, couple from honey, poultry, and then of course the grand winners are the drug companies. Next rule, this is kind of a subsidiary rule, macronutrient ratios are irrelevant. For the last 40 years, the big debate in nutrition has been, should we be on high carb, low fat diets, or should we be on low carb, high protein diets? And it's totally irrelevant. It doesn't matter what the percent of carbs and protein and fat are. What matters is where the food came from. And if it still has all of its fiber, then it's good food. And if it doesn't have any fiber, it's bad food. Mike Tehan, formerly known as Two-Ton Tehan, was a vegan. He was an ethical animal rights vegan. His vegan diet consisted of laced potato chips and Bud Light. That's vegan. But it didn't do much for his figure here. And he kicked the oil. He just threw out all the vegetable oil. And he dropped 158 pounds by just doing that. Now, I would guess that the number one problem in the United States right now is being overweight. And if you can do it by just getting the oil out of your diet, then that's a pretty easy way to do it. I don't think it's likely that hunter-gatherers or pre-agricultural people ever collected nuts and then squashed the oil out of them. Hey, they would probably eat the nuts. But about 3,500 years ago in Egypt, there's evidence that the Egyptians were using olive oil, and they were also using linseed oil to paint things. Linseed oil is the same thing, same as flaxseed, so we're now drinking paint as a omega-3 supplement. And the next place that oil turned up was in the Indus Valley, about 3200 BC, and they started using sesame oil. The Song Dynasty went for stir-frying around 1200 AD, and then the big disaster happened around about 1910 when Procter & Gamble came out with this stuff. This is Crisco. This mother is diligently teaching her daughter to bake stuff with Crisco so that the daughter's husband can have a heart attack about 1950, I would estimate. Here's a, a typical example of advertising uh, gone totally out of whack. So one way to reduce weight, if you can't buy a helicopter, buy a can of Crisco. The exact reverse of that, of course, because Crisco is 100% fat. The reason people cook with oil, I think, is because water boils at 100 degrees centigrade and soy oil boils at 300. So you can cook the stuff a whole lot faster. It, and that's why it's so popular. Frying cooks food very fast, but it also transforms something like a very innocent baked potato here with 220 calories into a batch of french fries with 632 calories. And if you cut it into chips and then fry them, you've got a thousand calories. So don't blame it on the potato, and blame it on the people that fried the potato. So never fried fry foods because in addition to raising the calories, it also produces all these unpleasant characters including polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which you may have heard of, they're carcinogenic. Well, there's gonna to have to be a little a simple biochemistry here. Sorry about that, but I've gotta talk about the two essential fatty acids, which are linoleic acid, the first of the omega-6 fatty acids, and alpha linolenic acid, or ALA, which is the first of the omega-3 fatty acids. Linoleic acid, we're swimming in. Ever since Procter & Gamble started making oil, we've been getting tons and tons of linoleic acid. Linoleic acid in a plant can go directly to alpha linolenic acid, ALA, and that's the one we really need, but we can't do it. We have to get the alpha linolenic acid from our diet. And it's hard going when you're guzzling up vegetable oil because it has hardly any ALA in it. It's mostly LA. 
in order to get from ALA to these elongated fatty acids like EPA and DHA, and DHA is really the prize because that is a major player in the brain and in the retina. So it's important for not only for intellectual function, but for vision. You have to get hold of a enzyme called delta-6 desaturase. Well, it so happens that LA uses that same enzyme to go from LA to AA, which is arachidonic acid. That's a customer you don't want a lot of. You have DHA trying to get made, but it has to wrench the delta-6 desaturase away from the LA. And if you're overwhelming that desaturase with excess amounts of LA, you won't be able to make enough of this stuff. So this is a possible problem for many of us, and it is a direct result of the use of vegetable oil. So Mike was right in cutting the vegetable oil out. Here are the omega-6 fats over here. This is LA, it goes directly to AA, arachidonic, and that causes all of these, in, these kind of pinkish inflammatory acosinoids. These things will cause inflammation in your body. So if you eat a lot of vegetable oil, you're gonna get a du double dose. First of all, lots of fat, and secondly, lots of inflammation. On the other hand, the ALA family starts up here, goes to EPA, the EPA produces some more or less anti-inflammatory acosinoids and finally goes down to DHA and that's the grand champ. It produces anti-inflammatory acosinoids as well as furnishing your brain and your eyes. It's difficult to get around this problem. However, I sorted the USDA SR22 and it turns out that the Foods, the only foods that really have a significant amount of ALI are, first of all, flaxseed oil. I don't recommend it because it's 100% fat, once again. But perilla seed is pretty good. It's got a lot of ALA and it only has about one third of the LA, which you don't want. Anybody know what perilla seed is? You can buy it over at Palama Market, which is right around the corner from Don Quixote and it's a nice crunchy grain. Flaxseed is also very good, but you can't use flaxseed unless you grind it up because it'll just go through one end and come out the other end unchanged. And you can't chew it unless you have a very tolerant dentist because you'll crack your teeth on it. Chia seeds are another possibility, and walnuts are not bad, but they've got a lot more LA than they have ALA. Okay, this is what happens with the arachidonic acid after the LA is turned into AA. You get a whole lot of this stuff that, as I said, causes inflammation. So you want to stay away from that. Well, if you're a vegan, you're well on the road to staying away from it because it's most commonly found in animal foods. And in fact, the highest source of AA in animals is sardine fish oil at 1.75 and the highest in plants is spices at 0.04. So you can see that just being a vegan gets away from a lot of that AA. One of the problems with oil is that it gets solubilized rather rapidly and then it jumps right into the lacteals which come into the structures in the intestine and go rather rapidly into the blood bloodstream. So fat is probably absorbed faster than the fat in nuts and seeds. Nutritionists agonize over the possibility you may get a protein deficiency. I was in medical practice for 35 years. I never saw a case of dietary pro protein deficiency. I doubt if the nutritionists have ever seen it. And I'm not sure that any of us would know how to diagnose it. I know that I saw lots of cases of serum protein deficiency, but it was always in people who had either liver disease or kidney disease. These two people have kind of a similar appearance, this guy and this kid over here. Do you think they're both fat? They kind of look fat. This guy is fat. He's one of the 65% of American adults who's overweight. But this kid is not fat. 
What he has is called Kwashiorkor. That is an African name for the disease that the first child gets when the second child is born. And that is because the mother stops breastfeeding the first kid and he has to go and start eating ground up cassava root, which is only about 0.85% protein. And that's not enough protein for this little boy to be able to keep the water inside his blood vessels. So the water all leaks out into his belly. And while he looks like he's fat, this is actually ascites, something that you see in a patient with severe liver disease, a cirrhotic, an alcoholic. Now it's too bad that this kid can't eat the leaf from the cassava because the leaf is 20% protein. But unfortunately, the cassava leaf contains cyanide, so it would kill him. This little boy also has an um umbilical hernia sticking out here, but his real problem is that this belly is all full of water and he's got kwashiorkor. He used to worry about the kind of nutritional education that our kids were getting up at UH. When I went in there about 15 years ago and looked at one of their nutrition textbooks, it had a basic four spread right in the middle of the book, and that was the only color plate in the entire book. However, this is uh, one that they're using now. Visualizing nutrition appears to be an entirely different breed of cat. It's a, it looks like a very good book and it has two intelligent paragraphs about one, the advantages of, of a vegetarian diet and two, the possible risks of a vegetarian diet. And I believe that both of those are legitimate and reasonable things to be talking about. As for the worry about protein, here are the same 10 categories of food that I put into Nutritionist 4. The numbers once again representing the number of foods in each category. And you can see that the RDA arrow is here. And the only way you could get into a protein deficiency on a vegan diet would be to eat nothing but fruit. And if you did that, yeah, you might actually develop a protein deficiency. Although I have known a few fruitarians who seem to be doing okay, but I don't recommend this. We got into a big snit about protein around the latter part of the 19th century with this guy, Dr. Carl Voigt. He was a well-established nutritional physiologist and he went out and surveyed German laborers and found out that they ate about 120 grams of protein every day. So he said, well, that's how much you need. And not exactly rocket science, uh, but that number stuck for a long time until a guy named Chittenden came back in about 1904 and said, well, you only really need about 65 grams. And then the USDA ran it back up to 127 grams. And then in 1920, Sherman brought it back down to 65. In 46, Hegstead, a nutritionist out at Harvard, dropped it down to about 36 grams, I think. The minimum daily requirement went back up in 1958 to 60 or so. And then the Canadians finally killed the beast and dropped the RDA down to 56 grams. And the RFNB, of course, had to go up a little higher than that just to be American and make sure that we all got all of our protein. So that's about where it stands now. You don't need all that much protein. What you do need is about 10% of your calories coming from protein. And if you get that much, that's all you need. So then the next argument that you get is, well, plant proteins are deficient in amino acids. They don't have, a, some plants are simply, they don't have the necessary amino acids at all. Well. Here's the same categories of food again, and I've got animal food and plant food. And you can see that there are indeed a lot higher levels of amino acids in the animal foods. You get about three times as much as you need. But you don't need more than you need. And if you ate nothing but plant foods, your limiting amino acid would be methionine, which is the sole essential sulfur amino acid in the human diet, and you'd be getting about 250% per of the RDA for methionine if you just went to a plant-based diet. 
there's good evidence that getting too much of this stuff, as you will do if you eat a lot of animal food, will be a good way to take calcium out of your bones. Here's another error. The Food and Nutrition Board sets the RDAs high enough so that only 2.5% of the population will not get enough of whatever it is they're recommending. But that means that everybody under this curve is getting too much, right? The RDAs are varied depending on the category of person you are. A child only needs about 1,000 calories a day. A, a very vigorous adult male may need 3,500 or even more if he's an Olympic athlete. But anyway, the, the calories are keyed to the individual and all of the RDAs for all of the nutrients are keyed to the calories. Therefore, the only thing that really makes sense is to sort foods by nutrient calorie ratio. And as long as you get all of the nutrients you need per calorie, you will automatically be properly nourished. Here's the USDA at work. This is from 1921. Uh, weeks meat milk, eggs, fish, poultry, and peanuts for an average family. I haven't found the peanuts yet, but I see all the milk. And there's a couple of dead fish here and a chicken. I guess the peanuts squirreled away in here somewhere. Of course, where we really got off the track with this guy, his name was Frederick Stair. He was the man who founded the Harvard Department of Nutrition back around 1946, just after he got back from the war. To start the department, he accepted $20 million from various aspects of the food industry, including Oscar Mayer, the dairy industry, big time. Dairy industry actually made up this basic four food group poster. According to this, we we're all supposed to get at least a cup of milk every day, probably three cups. There's had to be some meat and, you know, it's okay to eat some fruit and vegetables once in a while and some grain maybe, and then you were not supposed to eat too much of this stuff because even Stair understood that it's not a good idea to eat a whole lot of vegetable oil. So that's where we first got off the track, and the next thing that came along after the basic four was the food guide pyramid. The pyramid was supposed to be based on grains, and then fruits and vegetables, and then some milk and some meat, and you weren't supposed to eat much sugar and vegetable oil up here. This is what the pyramid actually looks like. This is what people are eating. Down on the bottom, a little tiny bit of fresh fruit, and then some vegetables, and then some grains over here. And along across the top, the base of this pyramid, which is turned upside down, is dairy. And the reason for that is because this is the stuff that the USDA bails out. They give money, your tax monies, to keep these very undesirable foods in business. Sugars and fats, dairy, meat, and they talk a good game of eating the fruits and vegetables and grains, but in fact, this is how much they actually do to produce those foods, about 160 million versus what, 3.8 billion for these not very good foods. Now, I don't know if anybody here was ever, ever able to figure this thing out. If they were able, please come up and explain it to me because it makes no sense at all. This is a pyramid, but that's the only thing I recognize. But it's irrelevant because they've now come up with my plate. I think they must have been taught by Bill Gates. My documents, my pictures, my music, my videos which you cannot get off the drive. They will not go away. And here the, here's the USDA with my plate. There's some strange notions in here. We've got vegetables, fruit, grains, protein. Protein is a category of food. Protein is contained in all of these foods, including the fruit, not much, but some. But it's not a category of food. It is a component of food. And then, of course, because the dairy industry is calling the shots at the USDA, we get a whole separate category, the inevitable cup of milk, which must be present at everybody's table. 
Well, if you want to become your own nutritionist, you can start off by downloading this. This is the chronometer. The good thing about it is that it's free. You go to this website and get this little Apple icon. It will do nutrient analysis. You can plug your food in over here and it will give you a printout of what you have. And I have written in a, a red or drawn in a red arrow here to show you how it should look. Yellow is the calories and the red arrow should be down on the calories and your protein, carbohydrate, vitamins and minerals they're all way out ahead of the red arrow, so you know that you're getting more nutrients than you're getting calories. And you're getting very little in the way of fat here. Now I prefer to use Nutritionist 4 because it doesn't just give you an average of minerals and vitamins, it gives you the specific items. So here is an example of a really complicated recipe. I doubt if any of you are going to be able to figure this one out, but our camera lady invented this one. And it consists of a couple of slices of raw tomato, a raw onion, a little raw onion, some romaine lettuce, a pita bread, parsley, Dijon mustard, and some red star yeast. It looks like this. It's a very tasty little sandwich and it meets the RDA for everything. All of these 19 nutrients here. The red arrow is down on the calorie bar and everything else in this, all of the bars are to the right of the calorie arrow. Protein, dietary fiber, vitamin A, alpha tocopherol, that's vitamin E, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, pyridoxin, folate, cobalamin, vitamin C, potassium, iron, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and zinc. So that's a complete food, and it's really simple, and you can eat as much of that as you want, or as little as you want, as long as everything that you eat in a day uh, has bars that extend out to the right of this red arrow, you're gonna be okay. You're gonna meet all your nutrient requirements. And here's another simple recipe. This is just vegetable soup. It's 26% of calories from protein, and 72% from carb, and I guess they forgot to put in the 2% of fat, but it's there. And this is really easy. It's just kidney beans, some red star yeast, potato, carrots, kale, broccoli, uh, tomato, onions. You throw it in a pot and cut it up a little bit and then eat it. Now this would be a great recipe. This is a, this very complex uh, recipe called a salad. And uh, you can see the red arrow here. And there's only one thing missing, and that's vitamin B12. And that wouldn't be missing either, except we didn't put any red star into this. You could throw some red star into some kind of a water dressing, and you'd have a delicious salad that would make, meet the RDA for everything. Now Mike Tehan, a two-ton Tehan, dropped 158 pounds eating stuff like this. This is just diced potatoes thrown into a, an oven and broiled for a little bit to make them a little bit crisp and then he throws in uh, some seasoning here and the chronometer shows that this meets the RDA for all of the essential nutrients that chronometer can analyze and there's very little fat in it. The fat's way down here. Here's the calorie arrow. So that's a winner, and you can go to Mike's website and get that. And here's his vegan corn chowder. This is also a very simple recipe. It meets the RDA for everything, and it's also very delicious. Here's our president's contribution to the latest in nutrition. These are dehydrated kale chips by Lorraine Sakaguchi. These are really good. You go to a cocktail party and there'll be a chips, right? The chips will be all full of grease and then you'll have to dip them into something else that's full of grease. So this is how you get the benefit of one of the healthiest foods on the planet, namely kale, by making it into chips. And all you do is dehydrate the kale and then pour some sauce on it and dehydrated a little more, and it's just like eating corn chips. It's very good, and 
once again, the nutrient values are great. You've got enough calcium because you've got kale as the basis of it, and all of these other nutrients are out of sight. I'm going to talk briefly about addictive foods. I think I already mentioned that fat, sugar, and salt are addictive. These are things we like to taste, and that's how the food industry gets us to eat all of their junk. But there's a rather subtle kind of addiction going on here, and there's a good reason for it. it there is an evolutionary advantage to a cow becoming bonded to its calf. And this is how it works. The cow's milk has casein in it. When the casein gets down into the calf's stomach, it breaks up and releases what's called casomorphins. And as you might imagine from the term morphin, it has addictive properties. It's an opioid. And this is a perfect system for bonding because the cow is getting a hit of oxytocin from herself, and which produces pleasurable sensations, and the calf is getting casomorphin. So the cow and the calf are going to stay together. Now the woman does not have as much casein in her breast milk, but nevertheless there is some, and when that casein gets into the baby's stomach, it will also split into casomorphin and she will get a hit of oxytocin from her own uh, hormone system. So these two parent-child type people are enjoying a mutual addiction to each other. This is another type of addiction, and this is a whole lot harder to figure out, but there are gliodorphins in wheat. These are also opioids. As you can see, they are similar to casomorphin. Uh, both casomorphin and gliodomorphin have seven amino acids in their string, and four out of the seven are identical. So how did we ever get addicted to wheat? What would be the benefit of that? It's true that wheat has been a major food for us ever since the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago. I don't think that there was any bonding arrangement here. What happened is the wheat is using us as a reproductive vector. The wheat gets passed into the next generation because we eat it and then we scatter the seeds around. And so the, the wheat has evolved to produce this addictive gliodorphin. And that in turn has caused us some problem because we're not all well adapted to eat wheat. There's probably Oh, 5% of the population that cannot tolerate this gliadin, both the addictive and the allergic component in gluten that makes it a problem for people who are subject to celiac syndrome. Someone asked me to, to explain why Psychology Today came out with an article stating that uh, there are three times as many former vegetarians as current vegetarians, and they had a rundown on it. They thought the first one was poor health. People went vegetarian, they got sick, and they quit. The second one is that a vegetarianism is a hassle. The third one is that people crave animal foods. The fourth one was social cost. Well, number two and number four are really the same thing. It's a social cost. So I rearranged the list. I put social cost up at the top because in my experience, there's really been no problem being a vegetarian. I've been a vegetarian since 1950 and a vegan since 1964. And the only part of it is that nobody else is. So it's kind of a social problem. And I agree with them about it being a social problem. Another reason that people quit vegetarianism is because they're basically diet shopping. They jump from diet to diet. They'll try the South Beach diet, and then they'll go to the Sears Zone diet, and they'll wind up on the Atkins diet. They're just shopping around to see which, what works best. The third thing is they cra crave animal products, and I already explained about the cheese. I think that of all the foods that people have difficulty giving up when they go vegan, cheese is number one, and it's because of the casomorphin. 
the milk has got the casomorphin to begin with, then you dehydrate the milk and turn it into cheese and you got three times the concentration and who can resist that? The fourth one is poor health. I think there is a legitimate possibility that not everybody can be a vegan. I'm not convinced of it, but you know, I cut you some slack if you don't think you can do it. And the last thing we need is people who are dissatisfied with a vegan diet. But if there is bad health on a vegan diet, I think it probably comes from this macronutrient flapdoodle that we've been witnessing for the last 40 years. We, first of all, we tell people they can't eat any animal products, and then we tell them, well, forgot to tell you, you can't eat any raw nuts or seeds or avocados, and that may just be the straw that b broke the camel's back. All the essential nutrients originate in plants, not in animals. So there's no need to eat animals. The second one, if man made it or it has no fiber, don't eat it. Three, fill your stomach and your nutrient needs before you meet your calorie requirements. Four, protein, fat, and carbohydrate ratios are irrelevant. In other words, forget about the macronutrient ratios. It's meaningless. Five, USDA and FDA food advice is unreliable. And six, you can and should be your own nutritionist because you can't really expect the government or the food industry to give you accurate advice. Okay, so if there are any questions, I'll take them. Thank you. Okay, the question is, where do you get your vitamin B12? The origin of all vitamin B12 is bacterial synthesis. It's a very strange molecule. It has the heaviest molecular weight of any vitamin. Doesn't look like a vitamin, doesn't act like a vitamin. Comes only from bacteria. You have those bacteria in your gut right now. But the problem is that in modern day humans, the bacteria have migrated down into the large intestine. B12 cannot be absorbed from the large intestine because there's a very complicated transport mechanism that's involved in absorbing B12. There are carrier proteins in the stomach, first of all. Then there are absorption proteins down in the gut. Then once it gets absorbed into the blood, you have to have transport proteins to move it around in the blood to the various places where it's going. So the answer to the question is, where do you get it? The most dependable place to get it is from a B12 pill. You can take as much of this stuff as you want, and you can go over to down to earth and pick up 500 or 1,000 microgram pills. That's a huge overdose. You'd never get away with taking that much of an overdose of any other vitamin, but it won't do you any harm. You actually only need three micrograms of B12 a day. Now, if you just want to kind of round out your diet so it looks like it's well balanced, go over and get some Red Star Nutritional Yeast. It's a very tasty, kind of a meaty flavor powder that you can put in soups adds a lot of flavor, also adds a lot of all the other B vitamins, and it has vitamin B12 that has been added to it because the yeast itself does not manufacture B12. They have to culture it on a special media and then they add it to the yeast after it has been made. He says he thinks he's probably getting all the B12 he needs from the capsule, and that's probably true I do recommend that anybody who is on a vegan diet get their serum vitamin B12 level checked once a year because this is not a laughing matter. You want to make sure that your B12 level is up where it belongs. And the only way you can do that is get a lab test. Madam? No, if you get a shot of B12, which is what you will have to do if you actually get a B12 deficiency, that is made by bacterial synthesis. There, there's no animal stuff in that. Uh, back in uh, 1946, George Bernard Shaw, who was one of the most veg uh, famous vegetarians in history, 
developed pernicious anemia, which is a type of vitamin B12, well, sort of a deficiency. It's not a dietary deficiency. It's due to a defect in the absorptive system that I described. And his doctors gave him liver shots. And liver shots have been traditionally the way to get B12. But two years after Shaw, the great vegetarian, suffered the humiliation of having to take liver shots, which were against his principles, Lester Smith at Glaxo Labs isolated vitamin B12. And from there on, no one had to take liver shots because of pernicious anemia. Yeah, if you get a shot, it's going to be vegan. It will, it will probably be made by the Rhone Polenc Pharmaceutical Company over in France, and they culture the B12 off of uh, culture media. Okay, the question was, are chia seeds as hard to digest as flax? And the answer is no. They're not as easy to chew on as perilla seeds, but you can chew on them. And they actually, you can... They're really tiny little seeds. They look like tiny little bugs. If, if they moved around, you'd probably run the other way. But you can chew them, and you can, put, you can spread them on your salad, and they make a nice little garnish. That's not from Kwashiorkor. That's, that's not a protein deficiency. A beer gut in this country is a beer gut. <laughs> and, in Africa, at the age of five, it may be kwashiorkor, but there have only been 19 cases of kwashiorkor ever reported in the United States. How do I feel about juicing uh, versus eating things whole? Well, you're probably better off to blenderize food rather than juice it, and you're probably better off to just chew it rather than blenderize it. However, if you're thinking, that if you juice the food, you're gonna lose all the fiber, you'll lose some of it. But if you take a, a sample of your juice and put it under a microscope, unless it's something like, you know, refined apple juice, you will still see fragments of fiber under the microscope. Vitamix, what do I think of a Vitamix? Irreplaceable. Okay. Mrs. Interlocutor, come and dismiss this minstrel show. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bill Harris, for a wonderful, incredibly authoritative information, as always. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344 or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.